Welcome everybody. It's great to see you. Thanks for being with us tonight. My name is Julie Carlucci and I want to first do a special shout out to all of our first edition club members. It's great to see so many familiar names and faces. Thanks for being with us tonight. Um, and uh, for our very special um, event to um, Patricia Engel's Infinite Country um, novel, which is getting rave reviews and was also our March first edition pick. So a lot of you have already read it and I'm sure you're just gonna devour tonight's uh, discussion. There's so much to talk about. Um, Infinite Country follows a mixed status family as they struggle to survive and reunite after a father's deportation from the United States. The novel spans 20 years of page turning family history told through the use of Andean folktales. Um, Patricia brings to life the courage and complexity of the immigrant experience, illuminating the hardship of life between two countries and two languages and the search for family and belonging. The question at the questions at the heart of infinite country are some of the most urgent of our time. Uh, who is allowed to in? Um, how will I be known? What is home? Um, Patricia is the author of several um, award-winning novels, The Banes of the Ocean, winner of the Dayton Literary Peace Prize, It Is Not Love, It Is Just Paris, a winner of the International Latino Book Award, Vida, a finalist for the Penn Hemingway and Young Lions Fiction Award, New York Times notable book, notable book, and winner of Columbia's National Book Award. She's a recipient of fellowships from Guggenheim Foundation and the National Endowment of the Arts. Her stories appear in the Best American Short Stories, the Best American Mystery Stories, the O. Henry Prize Stories, and elsewhere. Born to Colombian parents, graduate from NYU, Patricia teaches creative writing at the University of Miami. In conversation with Patricia tonight is Chris Feliciano Arnold, author of The Third Bank of the River, Power and Survival in the 21st Century Amazon, a work of non, uh, narrative nonfiction. He is also a recipient of a fellowship from the National Endowment of the Arts and a frequent contributor to the New York Times, Sports Illustrated, Washington Post, The Atlantic, Harper's, and more. So it's a it's a very well um, uh, versed group to lead us in a discussion tonight. Thank you, Chris and Patricia, for being with us. And I'm going to hand it over to you. Thank you so much for having us. Thanks, Julie. So happy to be with you this evening. And um, not, very nice to very nice to see you, Patricia. And, and congratulations on on the wave of of amazing enthusiasm for this for this novel. So well deserved, and, and I'm so excited to talk about it with you tonight. Um, and first, it would be it'd be great if you could just share a bit of the novel um, with us, uh, a, a passage that you could share, and then and then we'll dive into our talk. Yeah, sounds great. Thanks, Chris. So I'm just going to read from the beginning. I think um, Julie told you a little bit about the novel and, um, and I'll just give you a little bit from the start so you can see how it begins and you'll have an idea of where it's going. It was her idea to tie up the nun. The dormitory lights were cut every night at 10. Locked into their rooms, girls commanded to a cemetery silence before sleep, waking at dawn for morning prayers. The nuns believed silence a weapon, teaching the girls that only with it could they discover the depths of their interior without being servants to the temptations of this world. To be fair, the nuns were not all terrible. Some Thalia liked very much. She even admired how they managed to turn the condemned penitentiary population into mostly orderly damitas. It was a state facility, a prison school for youth offenders, not a convent and no longer a parochial school. The lay staff reminded the sisters to aim for secularity, but on those missioned mountains, the nuns ran things as they pleased. During the day, under the nuns' watch, the girls practiced their downcast gazes. They attended classes, therapy sessions, meditation groups, completed chores, uniformed in gray sweats, hair pulled back, forbidden from gossip and touching, but they did both when out of sight. At night, in the blackness of their dormitory, they gathered to whisper in shards of windowpane moonlight. When the nuns patrolled the hall outside their room, they became masterful mutes, reading lips, inventing their own sign language, moving quiet as cats, creeping like thieves. 
They listened for the nun's footsteps on the level below, sensing vibrations on the wooden floor planks, the search for rule breakers, disruptors their guardians would schedule for punishment at daybreak. The night of the escape, the girls made purposeful noise so the nun on duty would come tell them to be quiet. Sister Susanna was on the night shift. There were many latecomer nuns at the facility left over from some other failed life. The rumor was Sister Susanna was married until her husband divorced her because she couldn't have children. The plan originated with Dalia, or maybe her father deserved the credit. That afternoon, she was given rare permission to phone him from the administrative office. Family contact was restricted, since the staff believed they could be a girl's worst influence. Talia hoped to hear Mauro say he found a way to free her, have her sentence lifted, paid a fine, or convinced one of the rich residents of the apartment building where he worked as a janitor to call in a favor on her behalf. One never knows who might be listening, especially in a quasi jail for minors, some of whom were murderers on the verge. Talia and Mauro were careful with their words. He tried everything he said. There was nothing more he could do. She understood liberating herself from the prison and the country would be up to her. With the help of another girl, she spent an hour ripping bed sheets, twisting them tight as wire, thin as rope. She counted to 1,000 in the darkness, then gave the signal for the other girls to start shouting, fire, fire, fire. Sister Susanna appeared in the doorway. Talia waited to catch her from behind with a pillowcase over the head. They had cut breathing holes because they weren't trying to kill anyone, only to paralyze with fright. Talia held the nun while the others tied her to a chair with the shredded sheets, her breath hot on Talia's hands as another girl shoved a sock between her teeth to gag screams. When Talia arrived to the prison school a month earlier, Sister Susanna had called her into her office and told the 15-year-old she'd studied her life, as if that file of police jottings and psychological assessments on her desk could reveal anything that mattered. You're not like other girls here, she began. Yes, I am, Talia wanted to say. She didn't want to be singled out, treated as an exception if it meant putting the other girls down. I believe it was your desire for justice that led you to do an awful thing, but you badly injured a man. You could have blinded him. A pause, the rattle of voices in the cafeteria down the hall. She knew Sister Susanna was waiting for a response, a denial perhaps, more likely an admission of guilt. The nuns were always scavenging for remorse. Do you want to change? With faith and discipline, anything is possible. Talia was not stupid, so she said yes. The girls locked Sister Susanna in their room with the same key she used against them each night. Nobody would look for her or for the girls until morning. The sisters and lay staff were in charge of their correction and safety. There were security guards on the property, but they were all men, so the nuns made them stay by the front gates to prevent the girls from developing crushes and the guys from trying to seduce them, as if that were a greater menace than an uprising, the girls taking the building under siege, as happened all the time in men's prisons. The illusion that women are safer among women. The girls returned to their silence. Twelve to a room, the building held four dormitories in different corners of the building, each under the patrol of rotating nuns and staff. They knew the other girls. They had classes and meals with them every day. That night, they wouldn't worry about them, though, and Talia no longer worried about the girls with whom she planned her escape. The careless or slow would jeopardize her freedom. They would flee to boyfriends, friends, or relatives willing to hide them. But she had less than one week to get back to Bogota, to the airport, and out of Colombia. When they hurried down the service stairs, out through the back garden to run across the sports field and over the concrete wall spiked with broken glass to the road as plotted, she broke away from the cluster, hustling east past the courtyard, through the gate into the forested hills, spiraling down toward the valley. Halting in a shadow before her final bolt, she saw the guards in the watch house by the prison driveway, hypnotized by the glare of a small TV. She'd assumed them to be some kind of police. They carried guns, and the girls believed they could chase and shoot them in the legs if they were caught trying to escape. She ran alone in the fog, through the dirt and thicket. It hadn't rained in a few days, so there was little mud. 
she heard night creatures, frogs, owls, hissing insects. Through the tree canopy, the rustle of rodents or bats. An hour passed, maybe two, lights congealed. An illuminated road laced the forest curtain. She followed until she heard barking dogs warn she'd come too close to the fences of a finca, so she moved down the hill to the street. If you'd passed her in a car as she walked, small in her baggy captivity uniform, an expression more lost than determined, you might not have thought her a fugitive from the school for bad girls up on the mountain, the place said to reform criminals in the making. She came to a gas station, far from any route the other girls would have taken, approached a grandfatherly man worn jeans, filling up his truck tank and asked for a ride. Where are you headed? Anywhere but here. She only knew the facility was somewhere in Santander and the nearest town was San Vicente de Chucurí. The man scratched his beard. A word of advice. Don't ever tell a stranger you'll go anywhere. I need to head south. I hope to make it all the way to Tunja, but I'll take any route to get there. She didn't want the man to know she was headed to the capital in case police asked him questions later. At least from Tunja, she knew she could find her way home. The man said he was going to Aratoca, but would drop her off in Barichara. Lots of tourists and buses passed through, so she could likely find a way south from there. He wasn't leaving until sunrise, though. He needed to sleep a few hours before getting back on the road. She didn't want to return to the woods. Before long, the police would have turned over every vine on the mountain, searching for girls. She told the man she'd wait with him if that was okay. When he finished fueling, he pulled the truck into an unpaved lot behind the station and invited her to follow. She waited as he reached to open the passenger door, then dropped his own seat back, leaning into sleep. You can do the same, he said, eyes closed. I won't touch you. I give you my word. I have two daughters, not as young as you, but they're still my babies. Her hesitation was mostly for show. Even if he hadn't made such a pledge, she would have done the same, climbing into the truck, nudging her seat as flat as she could so her head fell below the window line, disappeared. So I'll stop there. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that with us. Um, it's such a it's such a captivating opening, and it, it um, I just love how you how you bring Toledo to life so so quickly and so immediately. And I was wondering, I, I know that among our audience tonight, we have members of the first edition book club who, who've no doubt read it at least once by now, but also potentially some audience members who haven't started the book yet. So could you maybe begin by just giving us a sort of thumbnail sketch of Talia's family that you describe at one point as being like split by an ax. And could you just sort of give us a, a brief sense of, of who Talia's family is and, and their circumstances? Yes, and before I do that, I just want to thank you, Chris, for joining me this evening in conversation. For those who don't know, Chris and I are old friends <laughs> <laughs> from way before the books came. So it's an honor to be chatting with him about my book tonight. So thank you for being here. Thank you. It's an, it's an, honor, it's a, it's an honor to think back on uh, when we first met before books were on shelves. <laughs> and, and when these, um, it's just really great to see all, all the, um, just the, the, the the ways that this book in particular, the, the themes that you've been working with um, for years now have just coalesced and sharpened into what I what I believe is um, just your most powerful work yet. And so I'm really excited to dive in tonight. Thank you. Thank you so much. So, um, yeah, Infinite Country is a story of a Colombian family fractured by immigration and deportation. It's a very common story. It's a, it's a story about a family that started with two teenagers in love, Elena and Mauro, who fall in love in Bogota. And like a lot of people, they luck into tourist visas and they go to the United States um, with the idea that they're going to come home at some point, but really just to, you know, try it out. Um, see someplace new, maybe work and send some money back home and save some to bring back. Um, but they don't go with the intention of being immigrants. It just sort of happens as it is often the case. They're almost accidental immigrants in, in a way, as many people are, or circumstantial immigrants. Um, so they get to the United States and um, Elena and Mauro with their young daughter. And then um, as their exit date approaches, um, and Anna finds out that she's pregnant. And so they make the decision, the difficult decision to overstay, which automatically puts them in a different status category according to the law. Um, and then as life continues, they have another child. And, um, you know, the, 
their life is narrowed um, due to their status. And of course, they're vulnerable. And it's set at the turn of the millennium, which is a time of great change in the United States as a result of the events around uh, 9-11 and how the culture really changed with regard to its perspective of foreigners. So I wanted to reflect all of that. And then of course, which what is always the risk when people overstay their visas is the, the risk of, um, of uh, deportation as happens to this family. And again, they're faced with some more hard choices, which leaves the family split in two. The father is deported and also the mother has to make the very difficult decision to send her youngest, her, her baby, to be raised by her mother back in Colombia so that she can continue to work to provide for the rest of the family. And again, this is not an unusual situation. It's, it's a very common one. Thank you. That, that's so it's so helpful to hear um, for, for folks to hear you lay that out. And I'm, I'm curious. Um, so you talk about this being such a, um, you know, a, a common situation for, for literally thousands, hundreds of thousands of, of people in this country and, and in South America as well. And, and yet so much of the stories that we hear about in the in the media just portray um, immigration is more or less like a one directional southern to northern move and this story so beautifully and um, painfully complicates that movement um, where we have uh, families and loved ones moving in 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 all directions in multiple directions and um, can you talk about why that was why that's important for you to to capture that sense of complexity in in a, in a, a story about how families move and find their homes yeah um it's I think so much of what we're um, shown in a way that we even internalize this story of immigration and diaspora, that it's like a door opening and closing. Like immigrants arrive and, and you know, they're living a diasporic life and the door closes behind them and they're so happy to be here, they're not thinking back. Uh, in reality, like you said, it's much more complicated and much more nuanced. There are a lot of complicated feelings involved, um, as is totally normal when you're leaving your homeland and everything that you know in life to go to a strange new country and start over. And often the driving force is the hope of return. You know, some, some people will spend their entire life in the United States and then return to their country when they have enough to go home and wait for death to come, you know, or they're, they're building a home for, for their family they left behind. Um, so not only is diaspora this, this idea of dispersion, but it's this idea of fluidity, of going back and forth and back and forth. And also for people who are children of immigrants or first generation immigrants or whatever, it kind of frees us of the idea that a lot of us were raised with, which is we have to choose. We have to choose an allegiance. And somehow we're a little bit of this and a little bit of that, and which implies some sort of inadequacy because we were, you know, grew up in the hyphen, so to speak. Um, when in fact, because of technology and the ability to travel and movement and all these things, we can have very strong bonds that exist in multiple places. Do you, um, do you feel that one of the things that, that strikes me as um, that is an undercurrent throughout the book is this question of, of timing. It's not only about um, the family is constantly grappling with not only like where to go, but when is the timing right? To leave is the timing right to cut to return home? Can you talk about as you were, um, you know, creating the, the lives of these characters, how you thought about that question of, of timing and the when in terms of how they decide um, how to how to navigate their their movement? Yeah, it's really just an accumulation of days. One day you wake up and you realize you've lived a whole life in a different country. But for this family, which is pretty common, it's just a series of very small de decisions. We'll stay a little bit longer, another year maybe, and then see what happens. Oh, it's okay, we'll stay a little bit longer, a little bit longer. And, and, you know, and then you end up with children who have lived nowhere else, you know, had their entire upbringing in the United States. So um, that's also really common. And I, and I wanted to write into that, that very often with um, families who, who immigrate, there's no master plan. You know, it's really just, let's see how it goes. And if it doesn't work out, we can go back or something or go elsewhere. And that's very much um, speaks to the impulses of the human species, which is to move. 
you know, to, to migrate, to seek better resources, to seek opportunity in order to ensure its own survival and to provide for its offspring. It's, it's an animal need to move. The thing is that societies and countries have erected these borders to make it seem like we're, you know, violating something, but really it's, it's an, a completely natural impulse. And so much of that speaks to what it, the desire to, to immigrate. It's just, a, a, you know, pursuing movement in terms of being able to ensure your survival or survive better. Um, and, and there's no looking beyond that. And so one of the ways, another way that you, you sort of beautifully and painfully complicate this experience is not only by, by capturing that sort of omnidirectionality of it, but, and, and the sense of timing and the complication of timing, but also the sense that even within families, even between, for example, husband and wife, there can be conflicting desires of where to go and when and if um, not to, um, whether or not to return. Um, can you talk a bit about how the conflicting desires within the family sort of shape the trajectory of this family's journey? Yeah, and that's, listen, really common. Um, the, the originator of the idea to go abroad starts with Mauro, right? He's the one who's more, you know, disappointed with life in Colombia and has the more adventurous spirit. And Elena, out of love, wants to go along, right? And because they're young, they're they and just starting out, they are full of optimism and, and a spirit of adventure. Um, so he's the one, he's the real catalyst that pushes the family into that new space. Over time, and there's there are many moments in the book where you know she wants to go back. She's the one pushing to go back, and he's the one saying, "Let's stay, let's stay, let's stay, just a little longer. It'll get better. Let's see what happens." And then it turns. And he says, maybe it's time to go back. And then she's the one who says, well, listen, now we have American born children and you know, we'll be taking something away from them and let's stay. And so they, they stay a little bit longer, but it's this very, very incremental time lapses, right? Um, and then when it gets to the point where Elena is faced with being alone in the country, she periodically makes the same choice again to stay a little longer, a little longer, but it's full of doubt. It's full of uh, longing, the pain, and she's left a mother behind who she may never see again, but she ends up being the one to stay alone. And that's very often the case too. Very often it's the mothers who end up shouldering the burdens of not only supporting the families financially, but also being the nurturers and really carrying the family forward. And can you speak to the role of the grandmother in the story and, and um... I was just so fast. She, I, I, I believe she's one of your most, your most distinctive and unforgettable characters. And um, can you just tell us a little bit about the role that she plays in, in that sense of home and in, in sort of holding the family together uh, across these divides? Yeah, um, Elena, uh, you know, it's just her and her mother when um, she meets Mauro and her mother runs a laundry shop in the Chapinero neighborhood of Bogota. And her mother has been left by her husband, who no one, you know, no one has heard from um, in decades. And she's very strong and full of love. And her daughter has been just raised in a nest of this, uh, you know, motherly love in a way that Mauro did not experience. Um, she ends up being even more of a grounding force once they leave, right? They, they want to send money home to help her support her laundry shop, which is failing. But also she ends up raising their youngest daughter, Thalia, who you met in the section that I just read, um, for 15 years. Um, well, shorter than that because she passes away. I don't think I'm giving anything away saying that. But, um, you know, she's, she's a, a, a wonderful character. I, don't, I was only raised with one grandmother. My other grandmother passed before I was born and I had a very you know, extraordinary grandmother. Um, so it's, um, you know, it's a pleasure for me to write into that um, space as well because you know, a grandmother is different from your mother or father, right? They're just, they're, they're enough level. You probably as a grandchild get the best of them in, in a lot of ways. Um, and, um, and they have sort of a wisdom and a grace that only comes with age, but then there's also something quite sad, but also magical in a way that, you know, you'll only have them for a short period of time. 
Um, so, so that's where the, the impulse to, to write her into the story came from. I, lo I love just the ways that she um, refuses to let Mauro come in the house until he's, yeah. until he's sort of gotten himself together. Um, and so, you know, in yet another way that you, that you complicate the, the narrative of diaspora and immigration in this story is through your portrayal of, of love itself. And in so many of the, um, you know, commonly held tropes about immigration, love is just such a simple force. It's about, you know, why do people move? Well, because they love their children. Are they, um, why do, um, why do people um, make these dramatic life changes? Well, it's, it's out of this sort of um, pure and always positive love. You, you complicate that deeply in this narrative with a line, um, one, of the, one of your characteristically excellent kickers to the end of your chapters, um, and, and the chapter two, so I'm not spoiling anything here. When you say, um, the, the narrator writes, people say drugs and alcohol are the greatest and most persuasive narcotics, the elements most likely to ruin a life. They're wrong, it's love. Can you talk a bit about the ways that love is ruinous in this story? <laughs> I mean, love is ruinous in lots of stories. Um, you know, like you said, people do wonderful things for love. People make a lot of bad choices for, for love too. Um, you know, it's um, it's it's really funny. We live in the United States, which, which is such a huge country. You know, it's it's massive. It's like you could fit so many other countries inside this one country. And we wouldn't think twice about, oh, someone moving from the East Coast to the West Coast for a relationship or for a job, you know, and it's the same thing as migration, right? It's movements, it's, it's seeking more, it's building your life. And um, so it's, it's not very different from what happens to these um, two young characters of Elena and Mauro, who, who they're both sort of waiting for love to find them when they find each other and love just, you know, transforms their lives in, in these really big and almost mythic ways and leads them down a path together that at times seems promising at other times it seems like you know it's going to be disastrous and then with the proof of time and and compassion and forgiveness and just holding on you get to watch it transform in, into something something better, something more meaningful, even though it's imperfect. So like you said, you know, we, we do have a very limited thinking of what love is or even what successful love is. Like it has to be almost mm -hmm. infallible. When in fact, um, imperfect love is really the, the most um, transformative, I think. Do you, you've been, I'm so glad you brought up the notion of just the sheer, the sheer size of the United States and the mm -hmm. way that we, we perceive of things that happen within these borders as being normal or understandable when in fact they're quite not. Um, I, I'm just, one of the things that was most for me, most successful in this book and, and most um, intriguing is the way in which you portray a, a, a damaged violent country that is at war with itself and it's the United States <laughs> and the violence, the way that violence and dysfunction um, and pain just saturates the United States in this book as seen through the eyes of the people who have arrived here is, is I think something, first of all, just very refreshing, but it's also interesting in that it's counter, it's, it, it's given no more or less weight than um, violence and dysfunction in Colombia in the way the two countries very much mirror each other. Mm -hmm. And so how did you think about as you were crafting this book, portraying the portraying the two countries and sort of what what lights you wanted to cast on on each on each um one if that makes sense yeah um i think you know the united states um is a wonderful country obviously but i also think you know when when you buy into this idea of perfection and being flawless and you're really um denying the humanity of the country and uh, denying it the possibility to become something better and to transcend itself. So one of the things that struck me when I was researching the veins of the ocean, my, my third book, um, I was spending a lot of time in Cuba for research for that. <laughs> yes. Just for the, for the benefit of the audience at home. Yeah, of the ocean. So was um, when I would say that I lived in the United States, people would look at me like it was the scariest place in the world. 
um, to live? And how did I survive without getting murdered when I went to the store, you know? And they had no desire to come here, you know? And, um, and so this is something that sort of caught my ear and I started tuning into more as I traveled and things. Um, and, uh, and that's really a, a largely held opinion around the world. Sure, a lot of people want to come here, but a lot of people uh, don't <laughs> and, yeah. and are, are very sort of frightened by, by American society and, and what happens here um, in, a, in a very common way. Um, and also part of that, you know, is very typical in the United States because of the media and, and things that we just, we receive and we repeat and receive and repeat it, which is things happen elsewhere. All these terrible things happen elsewhere. And of course, Colombia has, has experienced great hardship and, and tremendous violence and tremendous loss of life, right? Um, but also uh, we cannot look outward and, and have opinions without looking at ourselves. And, and, you know, in our own reflection and how we appear to the rest of the world. And this is so striking how one of the things, one of the things that the characters notice and that's sort of omnipresent in their travels in the United States is that people, there's constant shooting, like they're surrounded by shootings. Mm -hmm. um, there, it, it's, it's very much, you, you create a landscape that's in many ways, every, every bit as, as violent as the country that they left. And um, it's also, to me interesting too there's some just wonderful passages of of, of um and i'm not going to like read you from your own work but i was struck by when elena gets work um uh cleaning houses she's she's just very um struck by just how full of just useless objects american homes are um and she's struck by just the sort of weirdness of of suburban life in, in the united states and how how um how essentially people's lives are, are built here around stuff and things and consumerism. And so I'm, I'm curious how um, you thought about um, portraying the, the gringo household in this book. You know, I, I grew up in New Jersey, so it's, so it's, it's not like foreign to me. Um, but I also grew up in a Colombian household. So there, there are, there are differences, you know, and um, so those are things that Elena does notice um, specifically to how um, people um, behave around her when she's a person coming into their home to clean. Right. Um, and, uh, and she has different experiences that you hear about in the book, but yeah, one of the things that, um, I think that a lot of people who are, come to this country for the first time are, are stunned by are, for example, supermarkets, you know, American supermarkets are just so full of stuff, you know, and even just stores and things like that. And, um, and the, the, you know, the things that people can buy without thinking twice here, that's, yeah, it's, that's, and, it's do you, and do you, do you see the, um, I, I guess one of the things too, that's, that strikes me is the ways that you, that you emphasize in the context of the story, um, elements of, elements of Colombian history that we, that, or we aren't necessarily that, readers in the US aren't necessarily accustomed to seeing dramatized in books. So for example, um, I love that um, Mauro was talking about an ancestral knowledge and he very much values ancestral knowledge. Mm -hmm. And there's a passage in which you describe how ancestral knowledge gets turned into legend and it, it moves from, from knowledge to legend. Can you talk a bit about how you, how you wove those, uh, that ancestral knowledge and that, that ancestral history into um, the book and and why it's so important to Mauro. Yeah, um, so a lot of Infinite Country is set in Bogota, which is my mother's hometown. Um, so a lot of the stories, you know, are very specific to the region of Bogota, high in the Andes Mountains and the Department of Cundinamarca, which you know this was this was the the territory of the Muisca civilization, who were one of the four advanced civilizations of the Americas. So maybe they're a little bit lesser known than the Aztecs or the Mayas or the Incas, but they were there and and quite impressive and large in their numbers. Um, so because that's my my mother's, you know. 
home uh, um, land as well. I did know a lot of these stories when I was growing up. And then over the years, I heard more, I learned more, we're spending time in Colombia. People told me more. And, you know, just in the process of curiosity and research, one story leads to another, as you know. Um, but um, one thing that's interesting to me is how things are described, you know, we use this, we, we're so comfortable with categorizing things and ancestral knowledge, people will call it myth or legend or folklore, which is a way of pushing it down a bit, right? As opposed to, you know, a traditional history, right? And who's to say any of it is less factual than other things that are documented in a, in a more, you know, complete way. Um, so, but these stories are important because I think, um, one of the things when you when when people leave one country and make a life in another, really, the only thing that you take with you are your stories, you know, your memories and your stories, and you only hold on to them by remembering them and repeating them. And just like language, they're the first thing to go, you know, uh, from one generation to the next, the stories the stories can disappear, and and that's the end of them, right? So in the case of Mauro. Um, they become much more important to him because he's of that land, just like my mother was. They're of that land, you know. Um, um, I don't know, Chris, if you've been to Bogota, but I know you've been in the region. It's high in the Andes Mountains. It's a very specific landscape. The equator is different. It's different from, you know, the altitude we're at now. And um, the air feels different. Everything feels different there. So to be removed from that feels different, you know, and, and the stories take on even more resonance because they're explanations of our existence, what we're doing in this world, how we got to be here, what we're meant to do with our lives, what will happen to us after, and how we're to behave in, we're to behave in our communities, how we're to treat one another. All these messages come from those stories. And so he, he finds a lot of meaning and solace in these stories, as a lot of people do. And he wants to pass them on to his children, because if he doesn't, they'll disappear. I, lo I love that you mentioned the air. And to go back to the grandmother, I love that the grandmother believes that if a child is removed from the air too soon, that that child will be more or less have a sense of vertigo that will last their entire life. It's such a powerful way of describing the impact of that sense of displacement. You know, thinking about that notion of stories and, and uh, there's a character in the book who is, who, who, is, who is revealed to be the very much the family's chronicler, the family's storyteller, um, the character who's trying to piece together the, the shape of this family's journey and what it all means. Do you have in, in your family, can you tell us about like some of those, the family chroniclers in, in your family? Well, I'm the family chronicler the, of mine. I mean, you probably are of yours too. <laughs> <laughs> As most writers are, I think, right? <laughs> do you, um, how do you, um, how, is your, how is your perception of that role? Like, because you've been at this for a while now, right? Yeah, you've, you've written a lot of, uh, how, how's your perception of, you, of that role changed over the last, I mean, I was just earlier today, I was, I was looking back over some of your earlier works. I was sort of amazed that it's been like 10 years since Vida. Yeah. So I'm wondering, like, how how was your how was your thinking about your role as as family storyteller changed as you also become more of like a public storyteller in the same time? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so I'm not the first family storyteller. My grandmother, you know, who I mentioned before, she was a writer and a storyteller, and I definitely come from um, um, a culture and family of a lot of storytelling. And again, maybe it's cause we're, you know, fresh, fresh into our migratory trajectory where the stories are very important, you know, still. Mm -hmm. um, so um, yeah, I, I've been a collector of my family's stories but it's different from where I am as a writer. You know, I, I, I very much separate my writing life. I know it doesn't appear that way. A lot of people think everything I write is autobiographical but it's actually not. Um, I, I like the sacredness of my family's stories. I like to keep it there and for my family and for, you know, the next generation as well. Whereas in my fiction, you know, it's, it's, I get to do whatever I want. So sometimes there's traces that, you know, if, if you knew, knew me well, you could find them. You can find the inspirations in my life, 
in the things I've seen, the things I've heard, the things, uh, the things I've lived. Um, but then I like to just break it wide open, you know, in the world of fiction and let it become something else. For me, that's, that's the great fun of writing fiction. And also, I think you get to even go deeper into things and really find meaning in things that sometimes in your own life are harder. To, it's harder to do that because it's so close, you know? You talk about that impulse for uh, the readers have to seek out the autobiographical in your story or the assumptions that people make about the autobiographical nature of your work. Mm -hmm. Why do you think it is that writers who are writing about things like immigration, for example, are more likely to have that assumption made about them and their work? I'm glad you said that, Chris. <laughs> um, you know, it's true. And I also think it happens more to women. Um, I don't know why that is. I really have no idea why that is, you know. Um, maybe people, you know, think we're just, we, we're constantly trying to like work out our own shit so much. <laughs> Can I say that on YouTube? I don't know. Um, <laughs> yes, you can. You can. Well, you got the green light. <laughs> that everything is like, dear diary, this happened to me, uh -huh. you know. Um, but you know, as you know, we're artists, and and we come to we come to our art the way any artist does, which is to to transcend real life and make it into something artful in order to to. Um, Op open up portals to other people who encounter that art so that they can derive meaning and experience from it as well. Has your, um, has your thinking over the last, you know, 10 years of your work about diaspora changed, this, about the experience of, of diaspora changed? Yes, it has. Um, I think um, it, in Probably notions, my, my notions of immigration diaspora have changed in that somebody like me, who is the daughter of immigrants, um, was probably made to receive messages of, you know, not quite American, but you're not quite Colombian, which is, you know, oh, I'm, I'm all, all made up of not quite, right? So that's just, you know, meant to have feelings of inadequacy all around, right? Whereas um, now I see it as, some, as an extraordinary asset to be diasporic. And particularly as an artist, I think to have a mind, a, a diasporous mind when approaching art liberates you so much because it's allegiances to countries and to identities, fixed identities and things rather than fluid ones that create biases, that create blindness and blind spots so when you are a person whose family trajectory, you know, um, has transcended borders as you're the, you're the, the two girls, um, you get to be unbordered, you know, in your thinking. Mm -hmm. And you get, and I, I really think that in, in that unbordered space, you're maybe skeptical of all the narratives that have been, you know, um, imposed on you in, in various um, aspects of your identity. Um, as an artist, we are constantly at risk of replicating and repeating all, everything that came before us. So the great quest, of course, for an artist is to be original. And I think that when you exist in the diasporic space and you have, and you don't even need to be a diasporic person to have a de to a apply diasporic thinking, right? Which is without limit, open terrain, where your identity can be fluid and you can constantly be re-engaging with every aspect of yourself and deepening your relationships, you know, um, Every time I go back to Colombia, I deepen my relationship. I explored new aspects of it. And it's a constantly evolving thing as opposed to being a fixed, um, you know, um, incomplete thing um, as the message was, I think, in, you know, in years past of what it means to be a first or second generation immigrant. How have you taken that, that sense of liberty and how has that played out in terms of your craft. And what I mean by that is that it strikes me that the structure and, and your choice of point of view and structure in this novel is, is 
it's bold, it's audacious, it, it, that sense of being unbordered, um, it, you're, you're really doing some incredible things with point of view and structure here. So I'm wondering if you, that sense of liberty that you describe, is that something that you've had to, um, th th that it came, did, did, did you reach a point in telling the story where it just became like, this is inevitably how the story must be structured? Or I guess it's sort of like a chicken and an egg question, right? Like, did the, did the structure come first or did the structure follow by necessity the, the story of the, of the journey that these characters take? It's a bit like a march, you know, hand in hand. There is the idea, I knew that I wanted to write a story of a family, that it would be the story of the collective experience of a family going through the process of immigration together. But I also wanted to get at the private experiences of each member of this family of five individuals who are, who are having very different experiences. And there's things they're not sharing even with one another. So um, I had to think for a while how I was going to approach it. For a while, you know, I consider just an omniscient third person narrator. Um, and then I thought, well, you know, just like neat little sections where each person will, you know, say what they have to say. And then it became something else. And I, I think a lot of it, especially, you know, after you write one book and then you realize every book needs to be written in an entirely new way. Every book that you write is like writing the first book of your life because every book is different and has different demands and different needs and is basically teaching you as the writer what it needs to be. And you just have to be open and listen to it. So yeah, this book, um, you know, there was no formula. It was just, it was just kind of guiding itself. Um, and, and it's a bit like walking into the dark it's a bit like walking into diaspora, <laughs> you know, <laughs> where you have no idea what's coming next, right? Um, mm -hmm. Or if it's going to work out at all. So um, that's that's really what what I was just trying to do. But at a certain point, the voice crystallized and the point of view crystallized, and and it started to feel right. I'm curious if you could tell us a bit about as you were. Um, trying to decide where this where the center of gravity in this story would be why did you choose to begin where you did because all, all of these characters are on um have such singular journeys and to your point um along over the course of the book we sort of get a, a, a greater sense of the um interiority of sort of the private struggles of the, that they're not even sharing with each other but why start with why did you land a, a, with talia as the starting point for the journey that you wanted to take the reader on well, Chris, we're getting so crafty here, <laughs> but so I'm going to, I'm going to give you a crafty answer. So, all right. And then we'll go, and then we'll go back to some big picture stuff. Yeah. Um, so listen, if you want to break it down, writer to writer, nerd to nerd, Natalia, um, Ty, I opened to Talia not only because she was great fun to write, you know, and it was a really fun scene and I thought it would be fun to read, but also her timeline, she kicks off the timeline, which is basically a week. She has a week in order to get back to Bogota to get on her flight. So that's really the timeline of the novel. And then um, as it moves from there, um, with you go deeper into the past, finding the story of her parents, then, you know, it expands into the larger story of the family, but I wanted it contained within that period of the week. Um, at the same time, I also wanted the novel to feel like a conversation that the person telling the story, this, the family storyteller or whoever, it, you know, you've sat down with them and they're telling you the story just in, in one big breath, right? But it's also, I'm going to tell you the story about Talia. But wait, you can't really appreciate the whole story of mm -hmm. Talia without pulling back and learning the story about the parents, which mm -hmm. is very much how true storytelling happens in the real world, human to human. You'll tell you something, but then you've got to pull back to give context, right? And then to give more meaning to the present story, right? And so I wanted to, you know, replicate that experience, the human experience of being told a, a personal, urgent story as much as, much as I could. Thank you. And, and I, I appreciate you being willing to get into the craft, uh, the nerd nerd craft talk there. And, and I, will, I will not continue to monopolize the floor with more craft questions. We'll save that for another chat. But I do um, have some questions here from the audience in the chat, some of which are ones that I was curious about myself. So um, Barbara writes, I love the size of the novel 
Um, did your editor push you to write more? This, is such a, it, this, this novel is so epic in so many ways and yet at the same time, so, so thin. So I'm curious, did your, and Barbara asked as well, did your editor push you to write more? Um, thank you, Barbara, for the question. So the book that Chris was holding up before, The Veins of the Ocean, is a much bigger book. <laughs> it's about twice the size. This is 400 pages. So after I wrote The Veins of the Ocean, I, you know, I just, I like to do something different. So I wanted to write a compressed novel. So many of my favorite novels are really like slim compressed novels. So I, that was just kind of like a little goal for me. But also, I, you know, as I mentioned, I wanted the, the book to feel so urgent and necessary and not like it was meandering. I, I wanted it to feel like a story that you, you needed to hear now um, from this person telling it to you. So my editor, um, Lauren Wien, who is amazing, she was a, my first editor. Um, she did not push me to write more at all. She understood, you know, my designs for the book um, immediately. We worked very well together. Um, and that this was, you know, what felt true to the identity of this book, so. Um, another question that we have um, is for, comes from Harriet. I love the way you talk about migration. Do you have an opinion about the difference between migration before technology and migration now that we have the means to stay connected? Well, um, I'm not sure, thank you, Harriet, for the question. I'm not sure if you mean just um, um, how it affects processes of migration or just the experience of, of um, being um, apart or a country away from your loved ones. So I'll just speak to that part of it. Um, for example, I, my, my childhood was just, you know, marked with my mother's phone calls to her sisters back in Colombia, which were very expensive and very bad connections, you know, and they did not see each other sometimes for years and years and years. And then when they would see each other again, it was like, wow, they were just taking in the sight of each other. So imagine the things that we take for granted now, like video calls or even this, the Zooms, you know, FaceTimes, mm -hmm. all these things, right? Where you can be just having that experience of seeing, looking into someone's eyes and seeing their expressions and, and you know, being a witness to their lives, even if you're apart, um, that did not exist before. Um, even with emails and things like that, right? Um, WhatsApp, all the text messages, all those things where you can just, you can reconnect in a way that maybe softens the pain in ways that, that didn't happen before, you know, uh, where my, my parents and my grandmother had to write letters, you know, and it was just, uh, you, you lived in the space of letters and then waiting for the letter to arrive. And sometimes it didn't arrive because the mail was very bad. And just the isolation of that. So one of the graces of technology is that, and as we've all learned through this pandemic, right? When we're all separated from each other is how technology can be a gift for those who are otherwise separated or isolated and, and don't have the ability to, to keep in touch in, in another way. And I know that traveling is, um, whether, it's, whether it's home to New Jersey or home to Colombia is very, very important part of your life. And how has the last year of being home largely uh, affected your process? Like what have you been doing to, to cope and to keep that part of the imagination that is, that is animated by, by crossing borders and movement? Um, how are you, how has that affected like the inability to do that? How has that affected you over the last year, both art, you know, artistically as, and as a person, of course. Yeah, it's, it's difficult. I think um, I, when I did not imagine my book would be released during a pandemic, but I think um, certainly, even though I thought myself pretty uh, compassionate before, I'm even more tuned in now to just a small fraction of what it's like to be apart from your families for long periods, for reasons completely beyond your control. So um, I haven't seen my family in, in a long period of time. Um, for the first, almost first year of the pandemic, I was working on the editing of this book and preparation of this book, so that kept me busy. But I did have a lot of travel, research travels planned um, that did not happen, you know, and that's just 
what can I do? Just be patient like everybody else and, um, and indulge in my reading and, and other life things um, in the meantime. What is it that, and this will probably be, we're coming up at, at, our, at our hour, so this will probably be my last question. Um, what is it about that um, research travel that is uh, for you artistically um, irreplaceable relative to say, just like, you know, book research? Like why, why is that research travel so essential to you? I just think there's, there's not only information, there's experiences and details that you, you can get no other way except by being um, in a place. And I'm not just talking about just making one visit, but repeat visits and being open to the spontaneity that happens with um, growing familiarity of a place and the, talking to people and allowing people to tell you things. Um, so I've done that for all my books in the past and it's very special. The greatest thing is when you're working on a book and, and you can feel it changing you as a person. You can feel yourself growing, you know, with your research and becoming a better person. So, so, um, so that's a thrill, you know, and, um, and uh, I'm, I hope one day we can get back to that. I mean, you too, Chris, you travel a lot as well. And I imagine you haven't been able to. No, it's been, uh, been a while been a while so I'm, I'm you know eager to get back to it and I hope you I hope you as well get to get back to it soon and I guess I do have one more question I lied now that I heard your your answer to that question um this is this I think will be a good a good final question um how did this book change you you mentioned you know you can feel a book changing you as you're working on it how did this book change you wow um well you know I started writing this book um um, before I became a mom. <laughs> so um, I became a mom, you know, just before this book came out. So definitely, um, I, I, I wrote the character of Elena before, um, before that happened. And, um, and, you know, I, I in some way, I, I feel closer, I feel closer to her as a character now. So yeah, I understand things maybe in a new way, as you do, as you do. Yes, yes, indeed. <laughs> Well, congratulations on the new book, on the new little one. Um, I'm looking here in the chat. I think um, those are our two, two questions in the chat from the audience. And, and thank you very much for, for joining us here tonight. And I hope that um, for those of you at home who have already um, finished Infinite Country, don't forget to dive into Trisha's next or other books, um, The Veins of the Ocean, Vita, it's not love, it's just Paris I don't have up here with me. But um, if, you, if you love Infinite Country, you're, you're just getting started because you, um, you know, your, your work is just getting, with each, with each successive book, is just getting more and more powerful. And so thank you for sharing it with us. No, thank you so much. Thank you, Chris, for joining us tonight. And thanks to everybody watching. And of course, the book passage. I think uh, on that note, we'll maybe wrap up here tonight. Thank you once again to our two speakers. Uh, and uh, to everybody else who man managed to make it out tonight, we really appreciate all of the support that you give us or to any of the other independent bookstores that are all across the country, frankly, all across the world. Um, remember everybody, the book is Infinite Country. Uh, Patricia has a number of other lovely, lovely books that you can purchase. Uh, remember, uh, if you would like them, you can purchase them from bookpassage.com. The link to purchase the book was just recently pasted in chat by me. Oh, hello, kitty cat. Um, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Um, yes, if you like it, you can purchase the uh, book from the link that I put into the chat. Uh, or if you are uh, not the kind of person that enjoys computers, you can always just give us a call with our bookstore um, or to our bookstore, uh, and somebody will be on the phone and help you out. We'll ship the book to your house if you don't live in the Bay Area, and we'll put it on hold for you if you do. Uh, thanks again. Remember, we're on YouTube. So if you enjoyed the chat and like to be notified every time we go live, please click the subscribe button just below this video screen. Uh, other than that, I really, really appreciated uh, you taking the time to come out tonight. Uh, I hope that we will all see you again very, very soon. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Uh, thank you.